Oh no, I'm nervous about this. I just read this one and it's very, very concerning. In this video, I'm going to be sharing some negative reviews of my all-time favorite game. This is my favorite game ever, it's Spirit Island. I love this game for so many reasons. I've played it 53 times now. If you're new to the channel, thank you so much for joining. We're gonna jump right in. I'm gonna be reading really harsh, bad reviews for my favorite game of all time and reacting to them as well as giving my thoughts on them because some of them likely will have something good to say and something worth considering. If you are wondering if this game is for you, it's certainly for me, it's certainly not for all these people. Yeah, so we're just gonna jump right in and read these reviews. Okay, this is the this is my least favorite kind of negative review. Here, I'll just read it. <laughs> this person says, I came here because of all the people rating mature themed games like Kingdom Death Monster or Hate with a one, just because of their mature theme. This game's theme is boring. One out of 10. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> He's like real butthurt about this whole thing. I think the theme is great and very fun and very not boring. And I don't think that um, King of Death Monster is 1 out of 10 because the theme is mature. I'm sure there are some people though. Anyways. Absurdly long and complicated, most co-op games use artificial mechanisms to ensure that they aren't just a solo game. This one seems to use complexity and exhaustion to make sure nobody is able to alpha dog. So this guy just said something that's true about the game. Like legitimately, the designer said, I want to make a co-op game, but I don't want it to be one where someone can take over for the whole group and it's called quarterback. They don't, he wanted to avoid that completely and he originally was designing some mechanics to do that, some secret information stuff so everyone had to function for themselves and he was like, this game is complicated enough that no one is going to be able to alpha dog because because of that complication. So that was just part of the design and it works actually really well, but um, this guy didn't like it apparently. This one says, the theme is stupid, and the gameplay is very tedious. I think the theme's great. That, I think that's a, pretty much a personal preference thing at that point. Um, and honestly, the gameplay, the gameplay kind of is tedious. Um, it has some really beautiful depth and complexity, as well as um, some fantastic, just so much fantastic stuff going on in the gameplay. But it is fa fairly slow paced, and if you're not connecting with the theme specifically, and if you're not connecting with the puzzle nature of it, I would, be, I would be willing to say that Spirit Island would just be boring. Someone not finding the game to be evocative and incredibly fun like I do, to me, I'm like, yeah, I could totally see that. Don't, don't worry about it. All right, Admiral Crunch, he's laying the, he's laying down the truth. Pure trash, best used as kindling. I really don't have anything to, to say against this one. I mean, there's not any statements there besides that he wants to burn the game. Oh no, I'm nervous about this. I just read this one and it's very, very concerning. I'm just gonna say it, I'm just gonna read it. I hope you realize in this game you are playing as demons and opposing folks that historically help spread the gospel. No Christian in good conscience can play or support this game for it is inherently anti-Christian. I'm just gonna like completely say that's not true. This game is not anti-Christian. As a believer, I can't think of anything in it that opposes what we believe the Bible like like preaches. And as a Christian, I actually love this game because it, it it preaches that nature is sacred. And that's something that I believe as a Christian. So whew, that's crazy. Oh my gosh. Terrible, misguided design, nonsensical theme. Okay. Okay, this is interesting. Oh, this is a uh, cop cops. Mechanically, two words, needs streamlining. streamlining. Apart from the theme, I don't see what draws anybody in with this fern gully with, I don't know what that word means at all. Okay, fern gully is a movie about wood, a woodland fairy and her pals. <laughs> um, and so they called this fern gully with numbers. Uh, <laughs> says, uh, I don't see what draws anybody in with this fern gully with numbers filed off board game, apart from it being not similar to Pandemic. I don't see why there would be slow powers and fast powers apart from the fact that it's a game. I could, okay, I could give you a reason if you want to. No, 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 yeah. If tell, you want to know. Us, tell us a little bit about, for the for the people who are wondering if they should buy this game, why are slow powers and fast powers important? So the spirits in this island are all vastly different and the game is asymmetrical in nature. Um, so you're gonna see things like lightning. It's called lightning swift strike and he's gonna be going in fast and doing things immediately and reacting as soon as he wants to. 
Um, but then you'll see characters like Vital Strength of the Earth who moves really slowly and they use multiple different mechanics to to make that feel true. For instance, the Lightning's gonna be playing tons of cards and they're usually gonna be fairly cheap. Whereas this guy is gonna be playing one or two cards a turn and his powers are just generally more monumentous. It uses all sorts of mechanics to emulate this sort of difference. One of them is the slow and the fast power mechanic. And what that does mechanically is it, it, it makes some of your abilities happen before the invaders go and some of them you have to wait and they resolve after the invaders go, which can cause some complications. You have to work with that strategically. It creates some really brilliant... Okay, I am editing right now and I realized how many times I said the word brilliant. Um, it's hilarious. Count for me and leave a comment down below how many times I ended up saying that word. It's a good word and it describes Spirit Island really well, but to me it's just kind of funny how many times I said it. All right, let's get back to the video. Gameplay moments. But thematically what's happening is certain abilities take longer to do and not just longer in time but actually are functioning on a further out like scope of the island's time frames um in in the lore of the game as your spirits are growing they're actually becoming larger in their existence and everything is slower because they're just on a different plane of existence essentially um Pretty crazy. So yeah, so it's pretty crazy. Um, so this review isn't actually finished yet. There's some more. We'll see what else this guy has to say. Um, ironically, this game is designed to prevent quarterbacking, but the convoluted rules in this game would insist on quarterbacking. That does make sense. You have to. You could you, lose your agency as a player because you, you don't, don't understand the yeah. game well enough. So that could be true. If you do want to jump into a game and you can go, oh, I see what's going on here really quickly. This game might not be for you, and that's totally okay. For me. I've played it 53 times now, so I've spent like 80 hours playing the game. That's not an issue, but when I'm showing other people, it may be. If you want to see us teach Spirit Island and teach you the rules of how to play, make sure you drop a like and we would love to make that video. We've never done rules explanations before, but I personally am very passionate about teaching, um, specifically teaching a board game. They continue. And why would Spirits of the Land get more powerful when the colonists get more influence on the map? Shouldn't it be reversed? If that was the case, this might actually be a good and interesting, but no. Um, they get more powerful because that's just naturally ingrained in the Spirits' beings that they grow and change and adjust and learn. There's not much else to say besides that. It's like nature fighting back. It's not like... It's not about... If the colonists are getting more dominant, that doesn't change what the spirit's response is to this 100, 200 year span of time that the game takes place in. That's right. It's a really large scope game. <laughs> All right, yeah, I give that review four out of 10. They gave interesting points, but most of the review is them saying, I don't understand why, and there is usually answers for it, so. Is this actually just a review of all the bad reviews? Is that what I'm doing right now? Yeah, this is, I'm giving this review a two stars. Uh, David AC from England says, I say from England because it literally just says it right under that. I'm, I don't know. <laughs> in case you wanna know. <laughs> yeah, in case you wanna know. This guy's from England. Uh, he says, I don't get why such a boring game is so popular. <sighs> Me neither, no. I, I, I don't think it's boring. Peepsir from Canada says, don't enjoy co-ops as they are not games, they are puzzles. Ooh, it has hard levels. Relentlessly flailing over and over to beat a game is the epitome of pointlessness to me. Yay, I won. I could stare at the box cover and gloat, then immediately throw it out. If you like solving puzzles and gaining some kind of strange inherent satisfaction from fighting a game opponent that doesn't care if you win or lose or leave it on the shelf, then have fun. Best part about the board game hobby is that there are more and more co-ops and solo games coming out all the time, which means I'm saving a lot of money by not buying any more games. Does that make the game bad or just the fact that you don't like co-op games? I think he doesn't like co-op games. This is also one of my favorite things to do when I see someone's review. I like to click on their page and see what they do like. Uh-oh. <laughs> their only 10 is Magic the Gathering. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing against Magic the Gathering. Okay, yeah, he, he does like some good games. And then he, let's see what else he dislikes. See, this is this is too fun for me. Whoa, oh no! 
So one of his one star reviews is The Seventh Continent. I can see that. I think that this game is brilliant and fantastic and super fascinating. The next one is Android Netrunner, which is like my oh, sec- no! like, It's also in my top five. The only reason why it's not higher than like four or five is because I don't play it often enough which is uh, so sad to me. What did he say about it? Hype purchase, big mistake. When will I learn to avoid BGG rankings? I gave myself a one. I give myself a one for that. <laughs> That's funny though. So this guy's funny. The game also gets a one. Huge box filled with air. Requires expansions, requires deck building, requires interest in the theme. So first of all, that's what? true, and that's that is something that for a the lot magic of... player, he can't understand that you have to get ex. Yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> the heck? I was. He gives magic. I was a 10. this close to sympathizing. But that is literally what a, an LCG and CCG are. I was this close to sympathizing because I do understand a lot of core boxes in the collectible and expandable card game world are really insufficient, and I almost don't recommend. I I, I don't recommend most of them if you're not interested and excited to buy a substantial amount more. I personally recently like looked and went, oh yeah, I've spent over 200 on like five different expandable games so far. So I'm not, it's it's a familiar thing for me and it's something that I'm completely okay with. Also requires interest in the theme. <laughs> Isn't that true? Of if you anything? care about the theme, then every game requires interest in the theme. Unless like it's Castles of Burgundy and then you're like, honestly, that's a good game. We're getting off track. <laughs> We're reading well, this Well, okay, so this guy says, it might be a good game, but we'll never know because of the first obstacle, lack of theme interest. So he's literally saying, right. I honestly don't know because I haven't played it enough. One out of 10. <laughs> Gloomhaven's also one out of 10. Jeez. Yo. Exemplifies everything I hate in a game to the point I can't even call it a game. Uh, we're, 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 we're done that rabbit trail. Peepser from Canada, you're an enigma to me. If you're watching this, I'm very confused. <laughs> we read a bunch of one out of 10 reviews of the game. I think that we should read some some more positive ones because usually you're gonna see some really legitimate reasoning when you start looking at like four and five, like people who just don't like it. People who hate the game, you're gonna see a lot of just really re just reactive responses. But let's look at five out of 10. We're gonna read some reviews of people who generally don't like the game. And there's not gonna be very many people who um, think that it is anti-Christian or um, <laughs> maybe they think it's anti-Christian, but they're like, but honestly, I'm okay with that. <laughs> Dude, yeah. Oh, this person's review is in Korean. So we'll see what he translate says. It, translate. I'm gonna translate it right now. It's difficult and you need to know the cards. The end is futile. <laughs> That's pretty true, actually. <laughs> no, I don't think you need to know the cards. I, for instance, didn't know the cards at one point. Oh, this is fun. Some of the best reviews have an edit that say, after playing it more times, here's my updated thoughts. So they said, it's well designed, but overstays its welcome. If you have the wrong characters, it's extremely boring at the end because the more powerful characters will do everything, leaving you to just support them. Really was looking forward to playing, but it just fell short for me. Edit. After three more plays, I could say, I'm never playing this again. Extremely boring. <laughs> wow. Sorry, bro. Also, I love being the one who's supporting the person who's doing all the awesome things. That's just me. That's just like a different kind of player. So his review says, expensive, complicated, fiddly setup, fiddly movement, bad icons, and bad plastic for blight. Island looks horrible. Okay, sure. It is kind of fiddly. There's a lot of moving parts. It is complicated. It's fairly expensive, super worth it. And then he says, player boards look nice anime style. <laughs> They're not anime style. I, I want to spirit I've, island anime. I would also be happy if it was anime style or if there was a spirit island anime. He says, player boards look nice anime style. <laughs> That's a whole sentence. Too much pandemic ripoff and overhyped, it seems. It looks too much like a simulation, like playing pandemic solo also feels like a cerebral job rather than an immersive story. This is interesting because spirit island does naturally lean more towards the puzzle and the um, mechanical side of gaming, well, it's 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 more Euro than it is Ameritrash. It is less about that storytelling, but I think it's one of the most thematic games in I've ever played. Um, and so it's really interesting because at the at first you're going to find yourself enthralled by the puzzle and trying to figure out how to work the system and completely kind of. The, the theme and the, the story kind of
kind of goes to the background but as you get to know the game the theme and the story actually become part of the game in a really harmonious and beautiful way to me it's it, to me it's much more rewarding of a story and much re more rewarding as a thematic game because i actually was a part of it instead of the game is about a narrative and i'm t receiving the story and hearing the story i actually got to be part of the story and um the theme is it's, it's what's called emergent storytelling an emergent theme um, because it comes out of the gameplay and it honestly to me tells stories that only board games can tell and so to me that's one reason the thematicness of spirit island is one reason why it's so brilliant and it's just it's just so interesting that this game to me there's so many moments in spirit island i've played it and we would do something cool and it was really smart and strong mechanically but then we go do you know what just happened there and we would tell the story ourselves and so this game is a storytelling game but only if you want it to be and only if you choose to look close enough at it it's got some brilliant brilliant world building in it but the gameplay isn't a narrative experience until you decide to look really close at it and tell the story yourself so i think it's really cool this guy has a love-hate relationship with the game that's already interesting <laughs> um they say they love the different spirits and their unique powers. They say, I think it's a good solo game and I love the art. Uh, the reason why it's low is because of how complex it is. First of all, everyone I have asked to play this has given up because of how difficult it is. It's also aggravating that you have to always be thinking extremely hard about everything you do because one slight wrong move will probably end the game for you. Totally fair. I play this game with one of my housemates and they were able to recognize how brilliant it was, but they said, I was stressed out the whole time. Um, because it is a lot to think about. It's a lot to think about. I honestly don't know if it's that complicated. It's a lot of simple things together, but even though it may not be that complicated of a game, technically, it does feel really complicated because there is a lot to think about at every turn. It is a brain burner. People will praise it and will hate on it for it being a brain burner. So that's just something that makes Spirit Island divisive. Um, and that's completely okay. So if, if you're somebody who plays a game and just feels exhausted after and you don't like that, then uh, it might not be for you. But if you're someone like me, I love a game when it's complicated, when I, it makes me think really hard, when um, it's incredibly engaging for that reason. But then I heard from people who didn't and they weren't looking for that. And a lot of them have said things like, listen, I'm working really hard all day. And when I get home, I just want to sit back and relax and play like a much simpler like Keyforge or something where it's like there's some fun decision making stuff. But Spirit Island would just be exhausting to them. And to me, that's really interesting that like honestly, just like your lifestyle really dictates what games you may enjoy because for some, you don't want to play a game that feels anything like work because you just worked for eight hours. But for me, I'm not that way. So it, you just really have to ask yourself that. This game might feel exhausting to you, and if you have any like distaste towards a game that makes you exhausted, then maybe look for a game like, um, what's a less exhausting game that's also really good? There aren't any. I'm just kidding. Azul. Then maybe play a game like Azul, which which gives you tons to think about if you want to, but otherwise it's very simple in nature. This is this is great. This guy gives it Accenture Owl says 4.8 out of 10. Uh, unpleasant plotting. Great for an engineer, bad for people who really want to have fun. <laughs> it's so fiddly and there's so much reading that it hardly feels cooperative. That's a very, very interesting point you brought up. Um, because I actually have wondered that sometimes. I have played the game cooperatively and it really didn't feel super cooperative and it did kind of feel a little dry. But to, to me, when the game does work, there's some brilliant co cooperation. Um, there's some really fascinating interactions between all the spirits as well as the way that the team of spirits interacts with the island. I think it's brilliant as a co-op game, but I do think that sometimes it might not feel cooperative. And so that's a really interesting difference. But at the same time, I think actually what makes up for sometimes the lack of cooperation is just like a true level of brilliance of cooperation that happens sometimes. And, and, I, and I would say even often, um, the interactions between specific cards and specific spirits 
and the way that they work together is one of the reasons why I come back to this game over and over again. Ice Hot gives it 5 out of 10. The choices don't really hold much interest and this doesn't provide anything neat to add to the co-op experience. Pretty much a pass for me. We won on the first play without much trying or deep thinking. What happened? Yeah. Did they play it right? Because if, if someone's complaining about Three Islands that there's not enough to think about, he's given 23 games a 10. These are all generally pretty heavy games. He is really smart. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> also, if it was too easy the first time, make it harder. There's so many things that they give you to make the game harder. And it's not like, now it's harder because they're harder. It's like, it's really interesting. Um, I've seen some games do difficulty scaling really poorly and they'll, they'll just make it like, you have less health now. That makes you play safer, but that doesn't make it more interesting. <laughs> exactly. And so Spirit Island, the way that they scale the difficulty is all about making it more interesting. There's without any expansion, I think there's three adversaries and they all not only make the invaders more brutal and more challenging to beat, but they do it by making them do specific things better and so each adversary feels completely different and so it feels like you're coming to the game with a completely new approach instead of just i have to do better it's um i have to do better and different and adjust and be learn smarter. They, have to be it, smarter it changes the behavior rather than just the, the, the stats yeah so yeah great great Ooh, i have something to say about this one uh this guy's uh stiv Burns says art and production are pretty good, but the plastic figures seem out of place. And to that I say, you are completely correct. You are more correct than I've ever heard anyone ever be correct. The plastic figures are what the components are for all of the invaders. And the rest of the components besides the invaders are all wooden and cardboard and like nice. And the plastic figures kind of feel a little cheap um, a little bit like what is happening here? There's like they look off even. So there's a juxtaposition there immediately. The the invaders and the bad guys and the people who are the people who are coming onto the island and taking it for themselves. The plastic figures seem out of place. Isn't that brilliant? That's so cool. So this guy's negative review actually uh, had something very good to say. <laughs> These plastic figures seem out of place. Let's kill them. So the rest of this review is actually fairly insightful, or at least um, this person who wrote this review knows what they want and knows that Spirit Island doesn't give them that. And that is so great. I respect you. I respect you, Stiv Burns. Uh, they say feedback swings seem to be exponential. The majority of the game, you're either A, getting crushed by the AI or B, crushing it. This makes the moment of the swing very satisfying, but the outcome, which can be drawn out, pretty lackluster to that. I'll say even like the biggest Spirit Island fans will say the main flaw of the game is that the ending can be anticlimactic. To me, that's okay. I'm not always here for a climactic ending. I'm here for, for the development of my spirit and the way that I grow and the way my team works together to overcome the enemy. It doesn't have to be a climactic ending, but for some people, they do find it to be a problem. Even the designer says, that's something that I, if we ever did a second edition, I would want to solve that. If you um, want a climactic ending, go watch our live stream. That's true. We had a very climactic ending um, on our live stream playthrough of this game because what happened was we were all, two out of three of us were playing really slow and kind of, they don't really interact with the board a lot early on. And then Alex was a volcano. So he was kind of left to try to clean up things on his own. And we were like, we're on our way. And and we were and, uh, fighting against the, um, adversary whose main situation is that they're really fast and really efficient so it was rough but it's got a good ending so if you're interested in watching that playthrough um you'll actually see a lot of interesting cooperation that happens a lot of fascinating moments and i think there's even some of those great stories that happen where we go look what just happened here this is brilliant so that's a great place to start if you're interested in learning more about how the game actually plays because there's some really unique turn structure and um gameplay stuff that no another game does so watching it playthrough is actually fairly informative it was, say. it was a really good playthrough to show like a lot of things about the game mm -hmm. that are brilliant that review does continue and they say they think spirit island is most fun as a solo game and it plays fine with two but with four or even three it becomes unwieldy and i think that's true i, I or sorry, not true, but it becomes harder and harder to be an introductory experience the more players you have because the way that they make it more difficult, there's literally more island boards, which means 
even though it's balanced, there's more to look at and assess, and there's more threats. But there's balance because it's more spirits as well. It's just that it feels more complicated and definitely harder to approach. So I think that the game is, I think my favorite at two. I do enjoy it solo a lot and three and four are fantastic to me, but I think the game might be best at two as well, unless you're willing to dive deeper into the game with a, with a group of three or four. So yeah, everyone has a different opinion on games. Everyone is here to play games for completely different reasons. Um, so someone may hate a game that another person loves and someone may love a game that another person hates um, and that that's okay. But if you're looking for a game to play, you're gonna hear a lot of different things. And I will just say this, in my opinion, one of the best ways to know if a game is for you is if you hear the negative things and go, that doesn't bother me, that's completely okay. For instance, if you hear Spirit Island is overly brain burning and generally too complex, I would go, that's exciting. Um, and so for me, that negative thing isn't a negative at all. Um, and for someone else, it could be. So looking at what other people consider to be negatives about a game is actually a great litmus test in order to find out if a game is for you. And so hopefully hearing some of these negative things and then hearing my responses to them helped you to sort of piece together what you are looking for in a game and if Spirit Island fulfills that for you. Again, this is my favorite game ever, so I could easily, easily give you more and more and more and more and more and more reasons as to why it's so good and why I think it's brilliant and why I love it so much. For everyone here watching to the end, thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. It literally means a lot to me personally, but also legitimately makes a difference to our channel's success. Um, which is changing lives. It's changing my life at least. So thank you so much for joining and I want you to have a good day.